I am deeply honored in having been invited by Radio Pakistan to deliver the first lectures in the Iqbal Memorial Series. I shall be speaking on symmetry concepts in modern physics. Iqbal was our greatest poet, our deepest thinker. I take pride in the association of his name with these lectures for two reasons. Firstly, as a true philosopher, Iqbal fully recognized that there is no finality in philosophical thinking and that the progress of all philosophical thought must depend on new discoveries in the field of science. Again and again in his lectures on the reconstruction of religious thought, he points towards the possibility of breakthroughs still to come in the field of physics which may give a new outlook to philosophy. This, indeed, is what has happened since Iqbal's death 27 years ago. And an account of these newer concepts will be the theme of my lectures. Even though Iqbal did not live to see the fulfillment of his own prediction, I'm glad that Radio Pakistan has decided to dedicate these lectures to his memory, which lives forever. My second reason for welcoming Iqbal's association with these lectures is this. I believe that the rise of a great poet or a great writer or a great humanist in any civilization is not an isolated incident, that it's always accompanied by an equally significant emergence of men as great in sciences and philosophy. To give you one example, it's good to recall that at the last zenith of Islamic civilization, in the early part of the 11th century, the Shahnama of Firdosi preceded the encyclopedic Kanun of Ibn Sina and the equally encyclopedic Tanjim of Al-Biruni by no more than 20 years. I am absolutely certain that Iqbal's greatness in poetry and philosophy will not go unmatched so far as the present Muslim renaissance in science is concerned. I believe that now that the nation has begun once again to aspire to higher things, the age of Iqbal, just like the age of Firdosi, 800 years ago, will produce in Pakistan its great scientists who will rival the brilliance of Firdosi's contemporaries like Ibn Sina and Al-Biruni. The theme of my lectures is the search for unity in the understanding of nature. I am going to speak of a search which is as old as man's history. From the dawn of all civilization, man has wondered and asked questions. Questions about the color of the sunset, about the brilliance of the stars, about rainfall and cloudburst, about the trajectory of a bullet and a space satellite, and eventually about life itself. But in all this questioning, there has been one recurring theme man has always believed that the answers to these questions, when they come, must follow from just a very few general principles. Man has always held to an unreasoning faith in an eventual unity, an eventual simplicity, an eventual symmetry in any basic laws which may govern the universe. The history of science is the history of a search for such unifying concepts. During these lectures, I would like to show you how rewarding this faith in the unity, the harmony, and the beauty of the basic laws of physics has proved. I shall not be concerned with the processes of life. They fall outside my domain. My subject will mainly be inanimate matter, 
but within this compass I would like to tell you what we believe today to be the ultimate constituents of all matter and what we think are the basic principles which govern its behavior. Perhaps the first people in the history of mankind who made a systematic search for a unified and a rational explanation of the universe were the Greeks. The Greeks sought the final principles governing nature to lie in four elements of which they believed all matter was made. These, in their view, were the elements of air, water, fire, and earth. Greek thought permeated also early Islamic thinking, and this classification of elements remained as the basis of medieval science. The real quantitative breakthrough, however, came in the 19th century as the result of thousands of painstaking and accurate laboratory experiments accompanied by some of the deepest analytical thinking. The 19th century chemist could show that in the last analysis, all matter in the universe, living or dead, and of whatever form, absolutely everything is made up of just 92 different types of elements, and that every element can be subdivided into tiny units, the so-called atoms. These are the atoms of hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and so on. The 92nd atom is that of uranium. The science of chemistry is more or less summarized in the so-called periodic table of atoms. This is a chart invented first by the Russian chemist Mendeleev, which orders the atoms in the manner I have described. Hydrogen 1, helium 2, lithium 3, and so on. The 19th century chemist believed that the atoms were indivisible, that they could not be further subdivided. It was found that the atoms attract each other when they are at a little distance apart, that they exhibit a chemical force which is responsible for building from the atoms the complex forms in which matter manifests itself. One also found that the atoms repelled each other when one tried to squeeze them too tightly together. This repulsion meant that the atoms could be pictured as objects with a definite size, like little hard spheres. To get an idea of the atomic sizes, one may remember this. If a cricket ball is magnified to the size of the earth, then each atom in it will look as large as the original ball itself. The discovery that absolutely everything is made up of 92 types of atoms was a tremendous discovery. It made the 19th century scientist absolutely dizzy with excitement. The atoms were the elementary particles. The chemical force was the elementary force. In 1891, Lord Kelvin, addressing the British Association for Advancement of Science, went so far as to say, we have discovered in physical sciences all that can be discovered. The rest is more and more refined measurement. This was a bold statement, and like all such bold statements, by a curious accident of history, it was proved false the very same year. In 1891, J.J. Thomson, working in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, first demonstrated that atoms, after all, were not indivisible, that all atoms could be split into still smaller units. Some 30 years of feverish experimentation followed, led by two of the greatest men of the century, Sir J.J. Thomson and Lord Rutherford. And at the end, there emerged a synthesis, still deeper than any the chemist had ever proposed. One could now show that all atoms, all 92 of them, were divisible, that they were made 
of just three fundamental units. These fundamental units were very tiny chunks of matter, each weighing some 10 to the minus 27 grams. These three fundamental units are called the protons, the electrons, and the neutrons. All atoms have a central nucleus made up of two of these three particles. The nucleus is always made of protons and neutrons. Around the central nucleus whirl the electrons, just like planets orbiting around the sun. The atom of hydrogen contains one electron, of helium two electrons, of lithium three electrons, right up to uranium, where the central nucleus is surrounded by 92 electrons. Let me repeat. All atoms consist of a central core, the so-called nucleus. All nuclei contain about equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Surrounding the nuclei are clouds of electrons, whirling around at fantastic speeds, speeds in excess of a hundred thousand miles a second. In the heart of every atom, there ever continues a dance of the electrons, more fantastic than human eye has ever seen. The question arose, what is the force that makes the electrons keep orbiting around the central nucleus? This was a new, a mysterious force, the so-called electrical force. Experiments showed that a proton and an electron attract one another when close together. Two electrons, or two protons, however, repel each other. A convenient description for this attraction or repulsion is to ascribe to the electron or the proton an electrical charge. By convention, we say an electron is negatively charged. A proton is, a, is positively charged. We express the facts of repulsion or attraction by postulating a law. Like charges repel, unlike charges attract. I sometimes marvel at how easily human mind can delude itself and feel complacent that an explanation has been achieved, when all that one really has done is to express the same idea in a different manner. It's somehow more comforting to say electrons and protons carry equal and opposite electrical charges. One feels one has gone deeper into the hearts of things, that more has been said than just the bold statement that two electrons repel and an electron and a proton attract each other with a certain mysterious force. Perhaps this capacity to delude ourselves, to feel happy with words, to feel comforted, is a necessary price one must pay for the great gift of language which God has given us. But to return to the electrical force, this, then, was the primeval force which keeps an atom together. And later one was to discover that the force I spoke of earlier, the chemical force, the force which makes atoms stack together into molecules and stacks molecules to form crystals and living cells, was itself nothing but a manifestation of the basic electrical forces of attraction and repulsion. The deeper that one went, the more it became clear that the electrical force was the key to the understanding of the structure of all matter. For example, one could now understand why metals differ from semiconducting transistors. Some metals, copper and silver for example, have the property that electrons in their atoms are somewhat loosely bound. These electrons can drift freely and course around through the crystal lattice which constitutes a copper or a silver wire. The electrons in a transistor are not so loosely bound. They cannot flow through the length of a transistor crystal as easily. The transistor is thus only a semiconductor. To take another example, in biology one understood 
that our bodies resemble a modern electrified city. In a human body, just as in a modern city, there's a network of nerve fibers connected centrally to the brain. It's the electrical impulses which the brain sends out that control physiology. For example, a muscle contracts when an electrical impulse shoots out charged molecules, the so-called ions of acetylcholine at its ends. Physiology then, biology, chemistry, all these sciences in principle could be understood in terms of the electrons and the protons and the one fundamental electrical force between them. No wonder then that in 1928 the great physicist Dirac, the successor of Newton in the Lucasian chair of mathematics at Cambridge, could exclaim with justifiable elan, with protons and electrons we can explain the whole of chemistry and most of physics. Dirac was obviously right about chemistry, but was he also right about most of physics? It seemed likely that he was. For earlier in the 19th century, Faraday and Maxwell had made another very remarkable discovery. An electron or a proton, when accelerated, when oscillating, emit electrical waves. Just as a stick moving up and down in a pool of water sets up ripples, water waves in a pool. Similarly, an oscillating electrical charge sets up electromagnetic waves in space. And Maxwell and Faraday discovered that these waves could be picked up by other electrons in a receiving set. Just as the waves in a water pool set up by the moving stick would make a cork floating in the pool bob up and down in rhythmical movement with the moving stick. An example of the waves Maxwell and Faraday spoke about are the radio waves on which my voice is being carried out to you. The electrons in the cathode ray tubes or the transistors of your sets are moving in harmony with the electrons in the transmitter. If we shorten the wavelength of the electrical waves, that is to say we move the electrons or the protons somewhat faster, we get what is called infrared radiation. The human frame, as we all know, is not attuned to receive the radio waves, but we, or rather our skins, are excellent receivers for the shorter infrared radiation. We call this the heat waves. The sun is continuously beaming out infrared radiation. We receive this radiation in exactly the same manner as a radio set receives the radio signals. There's absolutely no difference whatsoever. Our skins may be likened to the transistors in your sets. Still shorter electrical waves can be received by the nerve cells of the retina of our eyes. These waves are called light radiation ordinary visible light. Still shorter waves are x-rays to which our retina are not sensitive. Still shorter waves are called gamma rays. The crucial point is that all phenomena of radio waves, of heat, of light, of x-rays are basically identical. All these are electrical radiations produced when electrons or protons in the transmitter oscillate. 
the waves are received by other electrons and other protons in the receiver's radio tubes, in its transistors, in the retinal membranes of our eyes, in the sensitive nerve cells of the human skin, or the electrons and protons contained in the silver atoms of a sensitive photographic plate. God said, let there be light, to make light and to perceive it. He made protons and electrons, the two charged fundamental particles of physics. <laughs>